Okay, so it's my pleasure to uh, kick off the evening, but I do want to thank Victoria and Teresa and Manu and the whole team uh, for having made the organization so far very, very smooth, very easy, and um, look forward to the, the coming week. Um, I wanted to start off also by just acknowledging uh, a very important partner which is the Allen Institute for Brain Science, uh, which uh, is represented here by Terry Gilbert, who will speak just after me. And um, we're very fortunate because I think there really are two key elements to this week, which is one, thinking about um, the infrastructure of the Human Brain Project and how to use that. But infrastructure without high quality data um, is, you know, is, is really limited. And I think that there, while there is data being produced within the Human Brain Project, the clear world leader in high quality data is the Allen Institute for Brain Science. So we're very happy that uh, we're, you know, working closely with them and that they're very, very well aligned and also participating in these educational activities. Um, I wanted to also just reflect for a, a moment, why are we here? And of course, it has to do with the human brain. Um, the human brain underlies our, our drive, our emotions, our drive to learn, to discover. Um, it actually creates our entire reality. And that's kind of a, an amazing thing to think, that there's three pounds of matter inside of our skull that generates our entire reality. And, um, underlies everything that we think and do. And at the same time, uh, it's also really challenging because while the healthy brain is key to who we are and to our friendships and to our, our social interactions with our, our families and with society at large, when something goes wrong, that also has an impact on who we are and our friendships, and our families, and our society at large. So there's a tremendous impact to the disorders and the diseases that affect the brain. And fundamentally, we don't understand any of them, which is quite a scary thing to say. We found a few compounds that help, but we really don't understand how they work. They certainly weren't rationally designed. We, we didn't go and say, this is exactly the molecule we need because this is the circuit we need to affect in this way. That's an after effect, you know, that's a post hoc explanation that SSRI is, well, we're, we're keeping the serotonin around. It's, like, it's really not the case. We really are just beginning to learn what's actually happening and it's very complex. And it's a multi-scale system that we're dealing with, a lot of layers of complexity. And I, and I want to emphasize that because I think that, you know, as we go forward with neuroscience education, I think from the beginning, we've got to be thinking from the level of the genome and the transcriptome and the cells and their connectivity and the circuits and the systems and the whole brain and cognition, we have to be thinking about that whole span. We, we can't afford to think only about one piece of this because each one of these forms loops back upon each other. The activity affects the gene expression, affects behavior, affect, you know, all of these things are intertwined. And we, we have an opportunity now because the data is being generated, because there's an opportunity to instrument animals with optogenetics and ways in which we can actually gather and perturb this, you know, gather data and perturb the system in ways that we never dreamed possible. So we have to start thinking about the multi-scale aspects of the whole brain. And that's really what I hope that this week will start to take us through. So, a few numbers on the worldwide cost. It's certainly um, estimated around two trillion annually in cost. But it, of course, when it's your friends, when it's your family, when it's society, 
societal problems, the cost is uh, measured differently than just economically. So one of the challenges that we have in neuroscience is that the data that we can get from any given brain is limited by what we can measure. And at any given moment, we can only use one or a few of these measurement approaches. And what this show is, this shows kind of the current techniques, more or less, um, that are available and the, and the temporal and the spatial scale at which they can measure activity or structure. And so you see that we've got about 10 to the 11th orders of magnitude, 10 to the 15th maybe, along the x-axis. And this is a tremendous span of spatial and temporal scales that the brain exists at, that it operates at. It operates from the level of, of individual molecules in this, in, within a presynaptic site up to, uh, and moving you know, in, in sub-milliseconds, up to the months and years of a lifespan and across the whole brain. So we have this uh, incredible scale at which the brain operates at, and yet we can sample just a few of those scales at any given time. So how do we get a complete picture? How is it that we're going to make sense out of a picture where we can only get sparse snapshots of any given spatial or temporal scale? And now, fortunately, the techniques are improving. If you look at the box on the, the lower right, th those are, that's the spatiotemporal scale that was approachable with measurements in 1988. So now we're, we're filling in a few more areas. But nonetheless, I think it's very unlikely that we're going to be able to measure everything at all scales simultaneously. So we're going to have to take a strategy of how do we integrate the data that we do get to, to form a complete picture. Now the data is extremely diverse and it is coming from across these scales and, and again I think I'll leave it uh, to Terry afterwards to talk about uh, some of the specific examples of, of high quality data coming from cellular levels. Uh, subcellular, cellular, tissue level, and whole brain scale that are actually all being gathered uh, at the Allen Institute. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the, the elephant and the blind monks, or the blind men. This is a, actually a 13th century Buddhist writing when, when these monks went to Buddha and asked about the meaning of the soul the quality of the eternal soul. And he, and he basically you know, sort of pointed to this, this allegory of these blind people climbing all over this object in front of them, feeling around and describing the pieces that they encounter. And one encounters something that he says, this is, a, this is a big fan. And another one finds a saber. Another one finds a tree trunk. Another one finds a stone wall. And they're all kind of describing in their own way the pieces that they encounter. But none of them realize that there's an elephant in front of them. And that's part of the challenge that we have in neuroscience, which is how do we understand the pieces in a way that we can describe how they fit together and understand what the brain really is when you link all of the different scales. There are a lot of different ways to do that, and I don't think that this week is going to cover anywhere near all of those ways, but you'll get a flavor of some of that. And there are different ways. So data integration and data-driven modeling are one of the approaches that you'll learn about. Uh, starting from existing data, data from the Allen Institute, data from the literature, data from other repositories or existing models building models in a data-driven way, running simulations, using high-performance computing to run simulations, and then validating that. A critical part of any modeling process is validation. Without validation, you have no idea if the model has any value whatsoever. And so it's really critical that this be an, a cycle 
of iteration, of model building and validation. And it's through the validation that you discover that you gain insight as to whether or not your model building approach and the data and everything is sufficient to actually build something that generalizes beyond the data that you use to build the model. Another important aspect of data integration and multi-scale understanding of the brain is organizing the data, organizing it into atlases. Part of that is to have a common reference point, just to be able to say, here's the space that we're talking about. And again, we're very lucky the Allen Institute has some of the best examples of atlases, template spaces built from a lot of high quality data for the mouse and for the human. And that provides an anchoring point for other types of data. Many different modalities of data can be measured and then registered using common landmarks to this atlas space. And the parcellations of this atlas space provide very useful references. And we'll give examples of that throughout the, the course. But also, just having a common nomenclature for brain regions seems like a pretty basic thing. But it's, it's incredibly challenging to get neuroscientists to agree to just call this brain region the, by this name. And the reason is, in fact, I've been in meetings where there have been near fist fights between anatomists because this brain region, it is not that brain region. And, it, and, and you know, there's no way they will ever accept that you call it that brain region. And, it's stunning because they're, you know, it's only through this special con magic concoction of stains that you reveal some of the organization. So this becomes very personal and very tense. We're getting away from it, but it's still a very big challenge in neuroscience to have standard taxonomies and parcellations of the brain and standard spaces. So another area where data integration is important and increasingly so is in the clinic. There's a tremendous amount of data being gathered uh, every day that a patient goes to the hospital. They get a blood test. There's data. They get a brain image, a brain scan. There's data. They answer a form. They fill out a questionnaire. There's data. Most of that really doesn't do much right now. It kind of sits there and it goes to billing. It's billing records, really. That's the vast, that's the primary purpose of the data in the clinics today is to make sure you get billed, okay? It's starting to move. People are recognizing there's a lot of value to the data that's there. We've got to collect it. We've got to integrate it. We've got to normalize it so that we can start to use it to actually understand how do we define diseases according to those clinical tests, according to the blood protein levels, according to the brain scans. How do we, how do we start to use that rather than, you know, I've got this shaking movement and I've got terrible pain in my head, right? Uh, the symptomology, there are so many possible things that can cause that shaking and that can cause that pain in your head. It's, we've got to be more precise. We want precision medicine. We want to be able to use the data to start defining the disease. And uh, this is something that you'll learn also about this week. So I don't want to take too much time, um, but I do want to briefly introduce the Human Brain Project. I think this is a, you know, the important part of the Human Brain Project is education and being sure to engage a lot of the community. The um, kind of key points of the Human Brain Project, there are kind of three main areas of activity in neuroscience to try to bring together data to better understand the human brain, in medicine to better define and diagnose brain diseases and, and disorders, and also to learn from this compact, energy-efficient ball of matter that can generate your entire reality on one of your meals per day. So that dessert was probably enough to power your brain all day, okay? That's a pretty good supercomputer. It generates your entire reality from a, I didn't even see the dessert, but it sounded good. And yet we have so much to learn 
from that computer, from that, you know, it's not even a computer in any traditional sense, but it's capable of generating a reality that all of us experience. And that's a, a, a tremendous thing on the power consumption that it uses. And just, just a, a word, just throughout this week, you can see we're on Monday, and we've had our welcome. Um, that's the starting level for the scale. But now we go across. <laughs> Tomorrow we get into some of the genetic mapping, the transcriptomics, and the identity of cells, built, w going up to building cells and circuits, and up to multi-scale behavior, whole brain atlases and models, and ending with some of the cross-species studies and, and clinical translation. So this week will really take you through, a really, a, I think, a truly multi-scale view on the brain. But it's important at each step to keep looping back to what we've learned earlier in the week, because as we think about clinical translation, how do we use what we're learning about cellular identity from the transcriptome to at the single cellular level to actually have an impact on patients' lives? This is happening now. And there's an opportunity to start, keep, keep, keep this thinking going and take this with you after this week. And I think that uh, there's tremendous opportunity in the years to come. So with that, I will welcome Terry up to, uh, to give her talk on the Allen Institute. So. so I also, I want to, uh, first of all, thank the HBP Education Program and uh, the Blue Brain Project. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's an honor as the Allen Institute, and all of my colleagues from the Allen Institute are sitting in the back corner back there. So, you know, I speak for them. It's, it's an honor to be a part of this entire week, and we're looking forward to showing you what we've got and having you work with it. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about the Allen Institute. So I'm... Has, is everybody here familiar with the Allen Institute? Anybody not heard of it? Okay, good. I just I had to check, right? So um, there's a. So the the Allen Institute. We really are asking big questions. We want to understand how the brain works. So you know we want to know what are the what are the parts of the brain. You know what are the the uh, the the different how are they connected? What are the different circuits? You know, how do they, uh, how is the information processed in the brain? And then, of course, you know, how, what goes wrong? You know, we're interested in being able to ask big questions. And, um, you know, and we, we're in a, the Allen Institute is in a, in a unique position to be able to ask those kinds of questions. So we are all about big science and open science and team science. And so you'll probably get a sense of that. As we uh, as you as we go along in the week, so you can you know if you're not familiar with what we've what we're doing, um, you know we've we've actually we started out mapping gene expression in the brain. It turned out you know the Paul Allen is the is our founder, and he was interested in understanding how he could contribute to the field of neuroscience, and uh, we started out based doing something very basic, which is just mapping gene expression in the brain, understanding where genes were in the brain when they arose like that. And so we started with the mouse brain atlas in uh, 2004. And we've also, we, uh, we looked at the developing mouse brain atlas. These atlases are uh, in situ hybridization. You know, we, we can go into that a little bit more later on in the week. Uh, we also looked at the spinal, spinal cord in uh, two different developmental stages. And of course, we were, we were also interested in what's going on with the humans, with, with the humans. With human, um, so you know we've got a, a human brain atlas. That's we do have in situ hybridization data for that, but you know as we'll get into later on in the week, it's difficult to do in humans what we did in mice. So we we started looking at different data modalities to be able to understand the gene expression patterns in humans. We did it in uh, non-human primates over development, and we also did it across development in in humans. And at that point, we really had set out what we'd, what we'd intended to accomplish, which, which was to map gene expression in the brain. It's not exhaustive. It's not every single gene, every single place, everywhere. But it's enough to give you a, a basic map to understand where you're going. 
And then we started to look at some, uh, you could say, more interesting questions. We want to understand how the brain how the brain works, and so we started to look at the connectivity, and where we want to understand the parts and how they're connected and, and what they do, and we actually even want to look at an, an alive brain and understand the information processing and what's happening there. So, you know, so what the, the atlases that I've circled here are basically around gene mapping. We did our uh, gene mapping data sets, in situ hybridization, microarray, RNA-seq. Um, we started to also get into some of the disease states but these atlases are primarily either gene-centric or structure-centric. So they're, they're atlases that you can get into either from understanding the genes or understanding the structures. And then uh, we started to put together data sets that are about decoding the brain. So these are, and we'll spend uh, primarily the first, we're gonna front load with these, these uh, atlases. So what we're, so, Many of you may not know, you know, pe most people know the Allen Institute for being, uh, for mapping genes in the brain, but what we've started to do, we're about halfway through a 10-year plan to understand how the brain works, and we're looking at uh, the different components of the, of the brain, so the different, uh, the different cell types, their connections, their circuits, the different uh, computations that emerge out of these different circuits, as well as um, being able to understand what's actually happening inside a, a live thinking brain. And uh, so we're, we're primarily focusing on cell types. So we're looking at cell types. We're doing this mostly in mice, but we're also doing some work in humans. We don't have, uh, a lot of the human data will be going online next year. Uh, and, and we'll talk uh, around the week about you know, how, you know, what we do at the Allen Institute and how we release the data, uh, you'll start to see that. And then we wanted to understand the connectivity and at, at several different scales. Sean talked about the different scales that you could look at and so we're looking at the, mesos, the meso scale and then the nano scale, we're gonna get very small. We also wanna understand the physiology uh, and the behavior. And there's also a team at the Institute doing a lot of the modeling analysis and theory to understand putting, integrating all of this data. So. You're going, to you're going to hear from VLAS and from Trigva a bit on the cell typing. So they're going to talk a little bit about that. Hopefully they'll talk about uh, some of their data. You'll be hearing from, from Forrest talking about connectivity, particularly at the, at the, at the very small scale. Uh, Saskia and uh, Jack. Jack's not here yet. You'll see him, I think, tomorrow, right? So, but they'll be talking about the physiology. And then, um, and then you'll be hearing a lot from the HPP about around the modeling. So our approach to understanding the brain is first we developed the genetic tools to be able to start to look at more uh, pointed questions. So we're interested, you know, and once we developed these tools, there were certain things that you could start to look at, such as the connectivity, the morphology, the electrophysiology, as well as the molecular profiles. Of, of, the, of the different cells inside these genetic tools. So uh, we, lo we looked at the anatomic mesoscale connectivity. So our connectivity atlas is, is that uh, there's, there is a lot of data in that particular atlas, which we'll be talking about more uh, in, later on in the week. We also have uh, our cell typing data set, which is, uh, we did whole cell patching, uh, patch clamp, to look at the electrophysiology in single cells as well as filling those cells uh, with biocytin so we could look at the morphology and those cells. We've actually created models uh, from the morphology and from the firing patterns of those cells. We also are doing, we're, we're still doing gene expression, but now we're looking at single cell RNA-seq to look at the, uh, the molecular profiles of cells. We're also, looking inside of the morphology, we're looking at the full morphology. So there's work that's been done to look at the morphology of, of single cells in the entire brain, as well as doing in vivo single cell recordings inside the entire brain as well. And we're, uh, we're looking at meso and microscale connectivity. So Forrest will be talking a little bit about that, about that data. Uh, and that data is not online yet, so you're getting, you'll get a preview for what's coming in the next couple of years. And then uh, we want to be able to integrate all of this data together. So there's, and, and you won't see any of that, this data as well, but this is one of the, this is one of the places that we're going. And we're also looking at synaptic uh, physiology. That's what Forrest will be talking about, yes? No? 
Okay, so, but, but he can talk about it. So, um, so now, and then we're, so we're looking at the connectional properties and the single cell properties, and uh, again, we also are interested in what's happening in a, in a live behaving brain. So this, that really incorporates all of it. And the Allen Institute has gotten, uh, gotten very good at being able to integrate data and have the data sets be able to tell us fundamental properties about the brain from, uh, from incorporating that data. So that's the intention is to be able to collect enough data to be able to understand some fundamental properties and you know, it, to, to integrate the way Sean was, Sean was explaining. So pretty much how we work is we've, we've started, especially in this, set, in this process, in the, in the phase of work that we're doing at the Allen Institute now, we've created some genetic tools. And uh, from those tools, we've got uh, single, cell, single cell, cell characterization happening, transcriptomic, uh, physiological, morphological. The idea with that data set is to, uh, to, to produce a data-driven taxonomy of cell types for the brain. So we are in no way complete with that, that data at this point. And one of the things that the Allen Institute does is we collect the data and once it passes QC, it goes online. So there is a lot of data online yet that hasn't, it's not complete. And so we're interested in having you have access to the, the data at this point. And uh, as more data comes out and the story and the picture becomes clearer and clearer, you'll also have your hands in the data and you'll, you'll uh, you know, be able to jump in and we're clear we're not going to do all of this ourselves. You know, we're really interested in having people uh, around the world working on this data as well, taking a look at this data, analyzing this data. Um, and I'll, I'll, this, this is the first time I'll say it. When you find data on our website that is I of interest to you or that you would like to mine, you're welcome to publish it. So our, you know, we really are an open science model. So there's, you know, we've got plenty of users who never collected a stitch of data for their PhD theses, um, but they, they got their, they've got their PhD now out of having analyzed the data that was collected at the Allen Institute. And then that goes, that informs again uh, the, the making of more genetic tools. And so we're interested in mapping the connectivity from defined cell types and then determining the role of cell types in circuit function. Okay, and then there's also the, the Allen Institute has a, I'm gonna run through this really quick. The Allen Institute has a lot of uh, tools to help you understand the brain a bit. So I know that there are people here who are not neuroscientists, you don't know neuroanatomy, anybody in that space? Okay, great. There's, there's a lot of neuroanatomists that went ahead of us, so you don't need to know neuroanatomy anymore. And I, what I want to point to is some of the tools on the website that are available, so you can start right away. So if somebody mentions the name of a brain, you have no idea, even though what Sean said was accurate, it probably isn't named that in our atlases, but at least you can try. You can look for the structure or you can look for a gene. There's this, and this is from our, our webpage, brain-map.org. Um, you, can, you can do a site search to find all the data that we have on that particular gene or that particular structure. There's also an overview page. I recommend that to look at all the different atlases that we do have because there's no way that we're gonna cover all of the different atlases. There's also tutorials. So there are five-minute tutorials. If you know you're interested in, in the human brain atlas or the non-human primate atlas, I recommend taking five to seven minutes out and, and looking at the tutorial. Also read the documentation. You can look at the help. Those are all valid ways. If you want to get into one of the different apps, this is something to do beforehand. One of the things that's very important is the reference atlases. You'll be able to find it from that spot on, on the front page especially if you want to see a, a picture of the mouse brain or a picture of the human brain, this is, this is one of the places that you look. Okay, and then uh, I wanted to, I had to actually add this picture in just so you could, the, the, the Allen Institute is, there's about 300 of us at the Allen Institute now and we're all working at, from many, many different dimensions on the same kind of question. So this is, this is, uh, this is all of us. And in case you're wondering where the ones that are in the room are, they're right here. So, and Forrest actually missed that picture, but we found a picture of him, so. <laughs> okay, thank you guys. <laughs>